So hey everybody, I'm Ryan Sayer. I'm uh, also known as uh, Two Echo Zero Romeo Yankee Sierra, and uh, also uh, November Zero Romeo Yankee Sierra. That was uh, this was actually award the, this this call sign was awarded to me uh, just today. Um, it's an American call sign, but strangely enough, I actually took the test in Cambridge. So and you can do that. You're entitled. You don't have to be American. Um, despite my. Uh, I am American, but I've lived here since uh, 2008, and so it's kind of, uh, it's fun, and uh, well, actually I'll give you a little bit about history, kind of like why did I actually get interested in, in this. Now, uh, there is a talk on Vimeo uh, with the same, uh, same title, this um, uh, Amateur Radio Original Nerd Hobby. Jim Bryce's talk is much more technical in nature. It's much more of a, a technical introduction to amateur radio. Now, the content of my, my presentation is a little bit more of the cultural nerdology, and I actually make kind of a loose argument as to establishing with the advent of electricity and using electricity for communications. That was really the genesis of, of where nerddom started. So it's a little bit more of a cultural discussion. There will be other talks that'll talk about um, amateur radio overall, and so if you want to know about packet radio or whatnot, uh, you can come see me and we can talk individually. But this is more of kind of a cultural talk, and kind of like what does it mean, what, is it, what exactly this is. But you know, interesting, interestingly enough, Jim Bryce, he had the Vimeo talk. Um, I also have this um, kind of this mentor, and there's this terminology in ham radio of an older guy, now I'm burping now, sorry guys. Um, uh, the idea of a mentor, somebody who kind of guides you through the process of understanding it, that's, that's deemed to be an Elmer. And the term Elmer is not used very much in the UK, but uh, in one of the sets of classes to learn uh, amateur radio, uh, Dr. Blaney Roger, he was really fantastic and really had a lot of spirit. He was a new ham, and he didn't necessarily have kind of some, uh, some of the cultural hang-ups that I think some of the old guard has. He really uh, brought in some enthusiasm into the, into the uh, environment. And then, of course, uh, various people contributed uh, into uh, giving me a little bit more info on uh, kind of the history of the nerddom of, of, of uh, hamming around. So, well, I mean, what is a nerd? Um, a anybody self-identify as a nerd? Yeah? Sweet. <laughs> Sweet. That's great. Guys, uh, you're, in good, you're in good company. I mean, the really, really the, the basis of this, and this is from, I think, either Wikipedia or Wik Wiktionary. There's, um, I cite, all, I cite all of my sources in the comments, so if you ever want to, to copy this for yourself, you'll have info, information that way. But the idea is that we're either highly technical or that we're kind of living a life of fantasy. And this life of fantasy, you might think of it as sci-fi, you might just think of it as head in the clouds, but I also think of it as uh, creating things, imagining things of what could be, not necessarily what things are. And so sometimes, as nerds, we're kind of maybe we're social outcasts, or we're getting frustrated, and we're going, ah, I hate the world. The world should be a better place. I wish that the world could change in this direction. And that's, what the, that's the beauty of, of nerddom, because we actually help revolutionize, we help change the world, and we make the world a better place. And it's very strange to see this kind of romanticism of, of uh, of nerds in the media, you see Facebook. Uh, you see the you see the Facebook me, uh, Facebook movie. You're seeing Silicon Valley, uh, Halt and Catch Fire. Really, kind of this strange romanticism in the media of nerds, and they've realized that yeah, we we do kind of make the world better. It's it's uh, it's an interesting thing. So that's the idea of nerd. But in the context of this, what's amateur radio? So amateur radio, really. This is a lot of words, but I'll give you the, give you the key thing. It is people that are interested in the concept of radio. So that'd be, be playing with propagation, that be, that'd be possibly using radio to be able to control things, to be able to communicate. There's lots of different elements of this, but it's just kind of people that are fascinated by this. This is not low power FM, so this is not broadcast. This is actually just trying to, pe trying to have a conversation with people. And interestingly enough, if you ever feel like you're a bit antisocial, uh, one of the great things, you, you know, we're, we're inherently social creatures, but we still kind of like to have that comfortable distance. Amateur radio is great because we can turn on the radio, we can call out CQ and see if someone's out there. They'll respond, they'll talk with us. And then the beauty of, of it is that if you're done, you know, being social, you can just turn the radio off. And that's beautiful because for, for somebody who has I mean, I'm an outgoing guy and I talk a lot, but um, there are times when it's nice to just say, oh, I just want a little bit of socializing and then I'm done. 
But the, the re really, really the key thing with amateur radio is that you have to go through a licensing process in order to kind of vet and prove yourself. And the, the early licenses, they're very reasonable. People, uh, people oftentimes get a license here in the UK within a weekend. In the States, it's actually self-study most of the time. So oftentimes, people will cram, 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 sometimes the night before, and actually get, uh, get a license pretty immediately. Uh, li licenses are actually granted through volunteer coordinators, volunteer examinators, and uh, invigilators here in this country. And they make sure that uh, everybody you know, has the credibility to hold the license, which is fun. All right. So what about CB radio? Everybody goes, oh, amateur radio, that's like CB. That's uh, breaker, breaker, one, two, three, right? Um, not exactly. This is probably, um, you, so any of you Canadian in the audience? No? All right, so I sound really enthusiastic, so most times people confuse me for being a Canadian. Um, many times if a Canadian is tired or maybe just a little bit further just depressed, when they speak, they're oftentimes confused for being American. And so you go, oh, hey, man, what's life like as an American living here? And they will get very offended. They will say, I am not American. I am Canadian. And it's very offensive. But to, a, to, a, to an American, if you say, hey, man, you know, you seem pretty positive. Are you Canadian? You say, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not Canadian. I'm American. That's OK. That's a nice compliment that you gave me. It's kind of similar to CB radio. A lot of, a lot of hams, they, they've worked so hard to study the study their tests, study, study the information. They're really focused on you know, signal propagation and, and wavelengths and, and lengths of antennas. And they go, ah, 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 uh, how dare you? How dare you confuse me with CB radio? And, and really, I mean, back in the day before cell phones, CB radio was kind of this wonderful free world. But it is unlicensed at this point. And a lot of people, uh, this, is, this is an editorial comment, but it really attracts the dregs of society. If, you really, if you're really into, tr into trucking and prostitution and drugs at services stops outside the motorway, go for it. Go to town, go to CB radio, you're going to love it. You won't even have to, you won't even need a license. Uh, but talking to CB, it drives me to drink, so you guys can listen a little bit more. Yeah. So, so, all right, so, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, Snowman, sorry, sorry, Mr. Bandit, the era of 1970s, Breaker Breaker 1, 2, 3, how many pounds am I hitting you with, it's kind of gone, so you have, to, you have to put that into perspective. So, all right, so, and then, and then somebody else said, hey, wait, wait, weren't, weren't ancient Greeks the original nerds? I mean, here's Pythagoras with his six-pack kind of pontificating about triangles and stuff. And he, and, and I would say, no, 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 because these guys were socially valued. They said, we like the idea of you dreaming and philosophizing and exploring this unknown world. And so we're going to give you the respect that you deserve. So were they nerds? No. And besides glasses and pocket protectors and, uh, you know, <laughs> it wasn't invented until the 50s. So, yeah. So a little bit more of con uh, context. So Marconi, I like to think of Marconi. So Marconi, uh, he's Italian. He, he emigrated throughout, throughout Europe. And I like to imagine that he was growing up, and maybe they said, hey, Marconi, that sounds a lot like macaroni. <laughs> and it drove him to say, oh, there must be a better world somewhere. And so he, he saw the research of Hertz, and he was like, wow, this is great. Ah, what I should do is maybe I can use this electricity and be able to communicate using a spark gap transmitter. What a spark gap transmitter really is, is it's, just, it's this thing that just creates a lot of static. There's a buzz, buzz, buzz. It's like turning on your vacuum cleaner um, and picking it up on your radio somewhere else. It was a spark gap transmitter. So it actually didn't really have a tunable dial. It didn't have any kind of frequency. It just threw some noise out there, and if you used uh, Morse code, you use the telegraph, then you could actually start to communicate wirelessly. So I, w I actually say that uh, Guillermo Marconi was the, I would say, the grandfather of nerddom. And, you know, of course, we couldn't go back in time to see whether he was picked on for his macaroni sounding name, but maybe, maybe that, was, uh, that, was, that was enough inspiration, enough push to go into that. that uh, so, ah, one more thing is he was a bandwidth pig. 
I mean, he, he just, he used all the bandwidth uh, possible, but I guess there was nobody else to complain about that, so, uh, yeah. But interestingly enough, the, these guys all over the world were kind of like, wow, this is interesting, let's start playing with this. And so they started building their own, uh, building their own radio equipment, building their own, their own stations, and by the time, I mean, it's not that long, we, you know, the first cross-Atlantic communication going, going into finally having amateur radio stations, an actual book saying, here are all these people participating on, uh, on, on the bands. And so I would say between 1910 and 1930, that was really the genesis of really the enthusiasm of the hobby um, where people got into. So there's the spark gap. Uh, it, everybody knows who Hedy Lamar is? No? She's a, she's a beautiful actress. Um, I, uh, she was very prolific, but she actually contributed to helping win the war. And her co-invention is this, this frequency hopping, this spread spectrum uh, concept, which really is the beginning of what actually enabled us to be able to use mobile phones. Because as we use mobile phones, we're kind of we're bouncing between a strong tower that we're connecting to and a weak one. And so if we move somewhere else, we, you know, we, we move to that spectrum that that other tower is going to, and then we're able to, uh, to, to work quite well. So Hedy Lamar, uh, I would say the most beautiful original nerd. Um, people might dispute that, but uh, I'll have to see pictures to, to, to really see whether that's true. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, she was, she was amazing, and she started exploring this idea. And, and so during that time, uh, and you can see kind of this evolution where we had Spark Gap technology, where Spark Gap was, was just throwing a bunch of, of white noise out into, the, uh, out into the atmosphere and picking it up somewhere. And then we're kind of going into a little bit more of uh, yeah, better oscillation. So very low frequency, then low frequency, and then high frequency. And we're, we're actually starting to experiment a little bit with uh, very high frequency uh, communication. So yeah, it, it, it was cool stuff. So after, after the war, nerd, the word nerd actually came about. So it came from a, came from a, um, uh, it came from a Dr. Seuss book. And the Dr. Seuss book, uh, it was just basically, it was just kind of Seussian, uh, Seussian gibberish. But somebody actually gelled on that nerd word and they went, ah, okay, I'm going to use that in lieu, in substitution of the, uh, of the word for square. And oftentimes, sometimes square was cool, but square became square, and so, and maybe it's hip to be square now, so I don't know where square is, but nerd's pretty obvious what it is. But the idea is, is nerds, nerds started leveraging this kind of communication technology, and we were able to get a lot of post-war equipment to be able to just, just make stuff. Because they weren't, you know, World War II wasn't going to come back in theory, so there was all this great stuff to be able to just hack on and see how it works and how to make it work. So really, really cool. It, and and this, this world actually led to some very, imp uh, very impressive modern inventions. I'll, 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 sh I'll give you some of my favorite nerds that, uh, that we dealt with. So Steve Wozniak, very prolific uh, ham. He actually got his, his uh, ham license when he was in the sixth grade. So that was probably like 11 years old. Uh, there are, I mean, there are stories about people getting their ham licenses at four or five, and that's really, really super aggressive. But you know, hey, if you've got, you've got nerd blood churning through your veins, it's, uh, it's a great outlet. Um, uh, everybody knows Nolan Bushnell, yeah, no? Uh, in the, uh, he was the co-founder of Atari, and so you know the Atari, uh, Atari system. He actually worked with Steve Jobs, who Steve Wozniak actually built some stuff for, for uh, Nolan. So it's there's a little bit of uh, nerd incest in there. Uh, Robert Moog. The musician, or the uh, the gentleman who made the Moog synthesizer, uh, you c you would imagine that the oscillations that you're creating through radio frequency would be very similar to the oscillations, the tones that you're creating on a uh, on a synthesizer. So Moog was really, really. Uh, I would imagine that this was very complementary and got him to thinking. All right, how do I make this electric piano make some amazing sounds? Uh, Bruce Perrins, any uh, any Debian hackers out there? Yeah, yeah. So Bruce Perrins was huge. I mean, he's, he's very significant in, in terms of the open source community. Um, in addition to that, Bruce Perrins, I don't know if he really hates Morse code or if he just feels it's obsolete, but he helped actually take away the requirement to learn Morse code in the late 90s. And now we can just focus on digital modes and focus on the actual purity of, of radio rather than have to learn Morse code in order to be qualified to use this. 
Uh, a couple more, Jack Kilby. This guy invented the, uh, the integrated circuit. So Jack Kilby was very significant. He worked with uh, Robert Noyce, and, and uh, it, was, it was quite significant. Uh, a couple of Brit uh, British sign uh, signifiers, Maurice Wilkes. Maurice Wilkes, actually, uh, he is the guy. So how many software folks are we here? So a couple, couple programs. OK, so he is the guy that actually invented the concept of microcode, the concept of subroutines, the concept of uh, uh, symbolic labels and macros. I mean, this guy just did some amazing stuff for, for, for computer science. To understand uh, you know, the, what is possible is really, really what's here. And then Helen Sharman, she was the first Brit in space. Although uh, the British government really didn't like her because she went to the Russian uh, space station instead of the, uh, the, uh, the International Space Station. And then a couple of uh, celebrities, they had some inner nerd in them. And so they wanted to, to kind of release that. Interestingly enough, Marlon Brando, he was almost uh, bedraggled by his, his celebrity. And so he would actually call himself Martin sometimes over the air. Just because, and, and they actually spelled Brando, B-R-A-N-D-E-A-U-X. Uh, because he was like, oh gosh, uh, you know, I want people to know me for me. I don't want people to just be seeking me out as a, as a thing. I'm going to take another drink. I hope you don't mind. Yeah. Okay. And Priscilla, uh, 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 any, uh, any Bollywood fans? He's like the biggest Bollywood actor. I'm a top back chan. He's also a big ham too. So yeah, a little, 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 more, little more context as far as like, because you know, there's a whole variety, a whole spectrum of nerddom. And I, I like to think of you know, something for everyone. And, and, and no, it's not related. Uh, the, the different hamming for different, uh, different nerding, it's not, a rela it's not a reference to forward error correction, not Robert Hamming. So. Um, but the idea is that uh, it, really the prime, prime feeling is that we want to create some international goodwill. We want to reach out and actually talk to people. And so the first time that I, uh, I actually rocked up on Wimbledon Common and I set up my antenna and I set up, uh, set up the battery and everything and, and I could hear people talking and conversing and then, you know, I, I heard someone call out and I responded and I was like, hey, hey, you know, this is me. And uh, that was a thrill. That was a thrill to hear somebody that I don't know, I have no idea, I don't know their background and I'm learning about them. You know, what is, what is it that you're, uh, about your culture? How did, I mean, what is the equipment that you use to actually reach me? You're, you're thousands of miles away, and, and it's quite fun. So it's, it's, it's a little bit more of like a cleaner social network because people know that they're being exposed and they're using their call signs, so they're being honest with who, th who they are. Um, and, uh, and it's just an exploration, it's a social exploration. But uh, as far as uh, the other things, de-expeditions, that's the idea that you might go on a boat and the boat wants to be able to make, uh, make contacts with the different countries as you're in the middle of international waters. People will actually welcome you onto these yachts and say, oh, you're a ham, you're, you're, you're an amateur radio uh, person, you can be our comms person and you can get free, uh, free travel to uh, lots of exotic locations just by having this credibility of having a call sign and, and uh, saying, hey, I'm willing to come along. But there's all sorts of cool stuff. Software-defined radio, I think that that's super, super awesome. Uh, there's actually going to be a talk uh, on software-defined radio. And what that really is is that's, uh, that we've, gotten ch uh, we've had chips, communication chips, uh, that have become so fast that it can sample pretty much all of the spectrum that we can listen to and then we can process the, all of that spectrum into you know, single channels or whatnot. And so there's some, some really, really cool tools that are coming about because software-defined radio re has replaced a lot of the transistors and a lot of the discrete logic that, that's required of it. And then, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of crazy stuff. If you like satellites, if you, wanna, if you wanna bounce signals off of the moon, I mean, come on, if you're doing D&D &D and you're, you're stuck between, you know, the, the, the person who's, who's supposed to roll the die uh, is, uh, is out, out to having a loo break, you know, it would be cool to say, hey, you know, I've communicated using, you know, bouncing signals off the moon. I, that's nerd credibility right there. So it, there's fun. There's lots of fun stuff. So there's, uh, there's, there's something for everybody. And, uh, you know, really, what's, what's the modern world? I mean, why are we doing this? And, and interestingly enough, we're, we're kind of in this modern, era, modern world of, of tinkering. We're kind of exploring things to, uh, to really build things again. I think that probably, 
uh, maybe 1995 to maybe 2005. It was kind of a dark time to be a tinkerer because we didn't really didn't have these platforms, these tools. And now this is really kind of the commonality. And this is beautiful stuff. Arduino, Raspberry Pi, all these networks, all these cool stuff. I mean, people are hacking on quadcopters and throwing on all sorts of augmentation to create their own drones and whatnot. And it's, it's cool. We are living in this new world. And really, the, this tinkering mindset is the same thing as what the old guys, you know, years and years and years ago were, were doing with the radios. It's just that we have so many more things to play with. So this is very much an, uh, a, a uh, augmentation of the existing, uh, of, the, uh, of the culture that's, that's uh, here today. One thing that I have to emphasize as well, so communication should be free. We don't have to pay for an internet connection in order to communicate and have international goodwill. Um, we don't have to do that. We, you know, the, the, the airwaves are ours. And if we don't use the airwaves ourselves, then we're going to lose out. You know, the government will say, okay, you know, these amateurs, they're not playing with the spectrum. This is, you know, we allotted all of the spe spectrum for them, but we're not going to, we don't see them using it. We don't see them exercising their license. And they will, they will take it away. They will give it to the highest bidder. They will give it to Vodafone. They will give it to, uh, to uh, Telefonica O2. And we will have to cry in our nerdy beers somewhere else. We'll cry. It'll, oh, it'll be terrible. All the salt from the tears burning up the circuits on the Raspberry Pis under us. This is horrible, horrible. I, we don't want to go there, but um, I, I, I think that they're actually encountering a resurgence. Um, there, aren't pub there aren't really recent numbers in terms of, of uh, people getting their licenses um, in the UK, but in the US, it's actually gone up again. And I think that that's good, because we've got to explore stuff. We've got to have fun with that, right? All right. So if you're curious, if you, if you want to, uh, if you want to little, uh, know a little bit more, we have an amateur uh, radio village which is nearby. We were going to have a giant mast, but the uh, giant mast kind of fell apart the last, uh, well, at least it wasn't on the motorway, but uh, it fell apart. And so we, uh, we don't have a giant mast, but it'll be pretty obvious because we'll have a fair amount of antennas. Um, but yeah, uh, come on over. We'll chat. Um, we actually have an, uh, a festival station called GB2 EMF. And if you want to listen in or, or suggest, you know, hey, you know, ask this question, ask that, or even play around with the dials a little bit, Obviously, we're, we're uh, happy to share with the uh, experience. So come on over. Uh, we'd love to share. We'd love to say, uh, hey, this is the cool stuff. Now, OK, so if you're one of the, if you're one of the types of nerds that is, uh, you're like, oh, I am too shy. I'm too shy to actually go up and ask about amateur radio. I'll watch them, but I don't want to, I don't want to touch anything because I get, might get yelled at. Instead of, instead of that, you can actually explore this uh, from, your, uh, from your laptop. Just go to websdr.org. And I, I have two favorites. There's one in uh, University of Twente in, in uh, the Netherlands. The other is, is Hack Green, uh, which is in the north of the UK. And I like clicking on that because uh, it is basically a software-defined radio, but it has a web interface. You can actually see the, the spectrums. And very interestingly enough, you can, actually, you, know, you can see the waveforms. And you can go, oh, OK, that's voice. And you see the uh, on-off waveforms, and you go, oh, that's going to be Morse code. And you can actually go in and click, and you can, you can see the beautiful waterfall images. And it's, it's really quite exciting, because you know, if you're listening to that, you'll listen, you'll hear a call sign, you'll go like, hmm, I wonder if that, call, uh, if that person actually has a website you know, giving a little more background. And so if you heard me talking, and I was using uh, 2E0 2 RYS, you could look up on the internet, just on Google, 2E0 RYS. You'll see my little bio, and then you'll see a little bit, of, little bit of information about me. So you might be hearing my voice, but you'll also know a little bit more about who I am uh, behind the scenes. And oftentimes, other hams, they'll have their, com uh, their computers nearby. So I'll, I'll call up, and I'll say, hey, hello, hello, um, and talk to them. And they'll go, hey, that's a beautiful cat that you have. Or, oh, hey, this is, uh, this is really fun. And I use the cat image because that was, uh, that was on my uh, uh, QRZ profile. So yeah. Does anybody? Um, I can, we have a little bit of time. Uh, does, it, does everybody want to hear about ham stereotypes? There's always nerd stereotypes. All right, all right, all right. OK, OK, I'll, I'll get that, and then I'll go back to, that, to, to questions. I, I kind of I love just kind of the humor of stereotypes. Like, I work within the IT industry, and there's a stereotype that most DBAs are assholes. Um, so let's, uh, anybody DBA here? No? I make fun of DBAs on stage. It's really fun. So uh, yeah, and the DBAs usually just raise their hand really slowly. 
Um, so, okay, yeah, so nerd, ham nerd bonus time. Oh, and the reason why they call it ham is because there were professional radio operators um, that uh, were insulted that there were enthusiasts of the, of the use of radio. So they were like, oh, these guys are just ham radio guys. And the ham radio guys, they were like, I mean, maybe they were insulted for a little while, but then they reappropriated the term. So it, you could think of it as nerd pride or ham pride saying, I am a ham, how dare you? So, okay, all right, so, so the, the, the cultural stereotypes here, so 200 Russian watts. So 200 Russian watts is, is really, really gets back to this, this, this idea of when you have a license, you have a limitation of, of how much power that you can pump into the atmosphere. And the Russian limitation was 200 watts. But interestingly enough, after you know, various wars and, and uh, police actions and whatnot within Russia, they, they had a lot of amplifier equipment. And Russia's a huge country, so they do want to pump out a lot of power in order to communicate with people all over the world. So uh, most of the uh, ham radio, or so most of the amateur radio regulators, they were also hams. And so they would have, you know, they would show their, their, uh, their um, they would show their amplifiers and they would say 200 watts, but really it was probably 10 times that. So 2,000 watts and yeah, you know, if you're, if you're lonely in Siberia and you're pumping out 2,000 watts, you'll be able to communicate and talk with people. So that's cool. Um, yeah, ah, anybody, hey, we have one, at least one Italian here. Any other Italians? Yeah, no, just, all right. So we've got one Italian here. There is a stereotype amongst at least European, amongst European operators that Italians also do not uh, respect the wattage limitation. Uh, so when you're, and it's very interesting. Uh, it's, it's more, more, you know, mega, mega radio, mega radio. Uh, it's just, it's, it, and very interestingly enough, you'll, you'll, you'll actually see that brightness of signal on the SDR. So if you're going on the web SDR and you, you see, you know, like normal kind of purpley uh, images and then you see something that's like white hot and you click on that, it's going to be an Italian accent speaking. It's just, it's just to be given. Uh, in addition to that, um, there's these uh, competitions, these radio sport competitions where people are trying to make as many uh, connections as possible and uh, oftentimes the Italians, they won't follow the rules and they'll just do whatever they want. Um, interestingly, and I'm not trying to pick on the, uh, pick on the Latins here, but uh, Cubans also, uh, they, they have a signal, but it's all oftentimes over-modulated. So what it is, is instead of having this amount of bandwidth, you're basically just splattering across lots and lots of frequencies. And, and people on the US uh, East Coast, they, uh, they'll, they'll look at their spectrum and they'll go, oh, it's Cubans again. So I, I, it's kind of a crazy thing, yeah. Uh, the Japanese, very courteous. Very, very courteous, kind. They're like, oh, yes, hello, da, da, da. Interestingly enough, they're the most licensed. They have, um, uh, they have 1.3 million licensees, which is a, which is a lot. And, and that's actually kind of symbolic of the fact that the majority of uh, radios, high quality radios, are Japanese. Uh, you know, we're starting to see some Chinese kind of stuff popping up. My radio is a super cheap 32 quid uh, handheld radio. That's Chinese, but um, Japanese are still very enthusiastic. Ah, yeah, so uh, I talked about kind of the grumpy guys. You know, these guys that had to go through Morse code, not because they like it, but because they had to do it in order to get the license. So they're, they're kind of, there's, uh, there's kind of some uh, technical ham butt hurt uh, about, uh, hey, hey, you know what? You don't know Morse code, you don't know dit. And, and dit and dit and da are, are the two, uh, you know, the, the short and long tones in Morse code. So they're just trying, I mean, everybody likes their little f fiefdom. And so if, if somebody's coming in and changing the rules of the game, you know, how dare you remix my Elvis song or something like that. It's just, it's just people just not adapting with change. Um, yeah, oldsters, ah, old people, holy crap. There's this, there's this whole band called 80 meters. It's, it's about 3,500 to 4,000 uh, kilohertz. And it's usually just old guys just talking about, oh, yeah, I was in the garden and the, and the fence fell down and oh. so, so these old guys are just, you know, they're just getting too, yeah, sorry. So some people joke, yeah, I was transmitting on the back pain network. Um, were you talking about your, uh, your, your visit with the, with the GP? Um, yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, so, so my boss, I actually came out of the closet as, a, as an amateur radio enthusiast to my boss. And my boss said, he's German, so I could maybe simulate his voice, but he said, he, first, he, first I said, oh, I'm into ham radio. He goes, he goes, no. And I'm like, oh, shit, did I offend him? You know, amateur radio? 
And he, he said, well, no, actually, uh, I, I am a world radio sport champion. And I was like, wow, well, sweet. Uh, maybe you've made a contact with my uncle, who, who does that as well. Um, interestingly enough, these guys are very passionate about racking up the points based upon you know, how, of, how much of an exotic locale that they've made a connection with and how many connections that they make in 48 hours. These guys don't sleep during the contesting. But to the other hands that are just wanting to talk about back pain and just kind of chill out and say, hey, you know, what color, do you have any dogs or other pets? You know, these guys, these guys are all offended because they're like, oh, the contesters, they're just trying to make as many contacts as possible. And they're not even, they're not even socializing. So there's, there's a little bit of, of uh, there's a little bit of umbrage between different cultures, but really they're, they're kind of the jocks of the band because they're really competing against, you know, oh, I got to make these, all these points and whatnot. And, and um, strangely enough, I used to work for a company who, where the CEO was a world radio sport champion. So uh, I, uh, I don't know. He's kind of jockish. Um, yeah, and then that finally, ah, this is actually a really positive, uh, positive stereotype that women operators are typically very, very good. And I don't know if it's just because it's so male dominated and like, all eyes are on the girls, but um, all of the contacts, all of the QSLs that, that I have heard, um, very articulate, uh, and maybe it's because the, the Maybe the tone is a little bit higher, so it's so super, super clear, very, very nice. So it's actually a very positive stereotype uh, to have women have. And so, uh, hey, you know, come on in, the water's fine if you want to, uh, want to explore that. Um, yeah, I'm mindful of time, but I think that we have a little bit of time for questions. So does anybody have any questions? Is that, uh, he'll, he'll, uh, he'll come around with the, with the microphone. If you ask me too many technical questions, you know, I, I'm under the influence, so uh, watch out. Um. Great talk. Uh, where are the radios? Where's your tent? Oh, where are the radios? Where, like, where's the village? Yeah. Um, I think it is that away, but I got here about uh, 40 minutes ago, so I actually haven't had the chance to go to um, the amateur radio village. But if you if you follow me around, uh, you you'll see me eventually get there. I'll, I'll search for antennas. Yeah. <laughs> so any uh, any other questions? Dumb comments? Really dumb jokes? No. Our, hey, hey, do you have dumb jokes? He's egging you on. So if you have really dumb jokes to say, you should... No? Okay, all right, fair enough. Well, uh, hey, everybody. Thanks for grinding through it. Uh, we'll get through it uh, some other time. And uh, if you want to more, know more about the, t uh, the technical aspects or want to know any of the aspects, come see me later, later on. I, will, I, I am wearing this uh, intentionally. So you can find the guy with the orange jacket. And uh, I'm happy to be the ambassador to help you out. So, yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody.